tahu Lancaster di mana? Lancaster itu kalau kita ingat peta Inggris, peta Inggris itu um, peta kalau dari Manchester itu ke atas dikit patokannya kalau kita cari Manchester atau Leeds itu agak ke atas. Nah, Lancaster terletak di situ. Bicara mengenai Lancaster, salah satu hal yang paling terkenal adalah Lancaster University Management School. Business school mereka salah satu yang terbaik, tidak hanya di Inggris, tapi juga di Eropa. Um, bidang studi lainnya ada psiko, ada medical, ada biologi, ada, ada, ada biotech, ada no science, uh, mechanical engineering, material, hukum juga ada, uh, international relation, hukum yang berhubungan dengan um, apa? Uh, bis, uh, berhubungan dengan human rights dan terorisme mereka juga sediakan sedangkan untuk program S1 mulai dari A sampai Z juga ada dari zoolog uh, bicara mengenai film bicara mengenai politik atau yang lagi rame-ramenya di Lancaster itu adalah Morse Morse adalah Mathematics, Operational Research Statistics and Economics salah satu bidang yang lagi rame Ya, termasuk marketing, manajemen, nah, um, ranking dan reputasi mereka, Lancaster University ini mendapat, um, mereka di urutan ke-11 di Times, Sunday Times Good University Guide 2022, di Complete University Guide juga top 10, kemudian Guardian di ranking 13, sedangkan di QS mereka masuk top 150 university. Universitasnya sangat menarik, Lok- Tanya bukan di kota besar seperti London bukan, namun sangat nyaman. Jadi Indonesia yang sebetulnya tidak hanya kuliah di Lancaster, tapi juga akhirnya berkarir dan ada bahkan ada yang menjadi dosen di Lancaster. Ya, oke, tidak berlama-lama lagi. Nanti dipantau di chat boxnya uh, untuk daftar absen berkala kita akan kirimkan. Um, kita akan mulai presentasi webinarnya. Um, saya akan undang um, Kostas, Freddy, and Anna with your lecture. You may start the lecture. You may begin. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so uh, I will just share our slides to start with, so we can follow the same lecture. So um, I hope you can all see it. So uh, just to uh, introduce ourselves first, my name is Anna Was, and together with my colleague Kostas Amiridis, we'll be talking to you about very exciting subjects uh, that we teach here at Lancaster. Uh, so we joined forces together and we want to present to you a lecture titled From High Hills to the Bahamas, Exploring the Ethics of Marketing. So uh, the reason why we chose to deliver this lecture to you today is because myself, I specialize in teaching marketing, particularly social media marketing and digital marketing. And here at Lancaster, I'm a program director for our course, Business Management. And Costas, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is Costas, and I'm a program director for a sister program, if you like, called International Business Management. Now, my specialty lies with something that we call business ethics. Brilliant. Thank you, Costas. So, as you can see, uh, we kind of merged our two specialisms in teaching to deliver this lecture to you. And this is exactly how... Uh, we like to look at organizations. Organizations are a combination of different functions and different uh, departments, but they should work together like we are with Costas today for this lecture. So without further ado, let's, let's start with what we prepared for you today. So um, you probably are aware and probably are also users of various social media platforms. And it is said that social media did empower people. Uh, so previously, if you were thinking, how long would it take to you to write something, maybe a book, maybe an article, and get published to reach out to a wider audience, 
it, this would be a very, very long process. However, with social media, with the, the, the properties of social media like immediacy, we know that we can uh, write the content and publish it very quickly without any delay. As soon as you hit a share or post button, it's out there. And also it removed the need for many, many layers of approvals. All of us can be content creators. All of us can get our voice heard through the means of social media. So in this means, definitely we can say that social media did empower people. It also helped us marketers like myself to reach to our audiences in a different manner than only just through a transaction means. So obviously we have the opportunity to talk to our customers, ask them questions, get some more data from them. But also it put us under more scrutiny because obviously whatever we do post to our audiences about our business can be um, checked can be questioned uh, by many, many eyes that are in our cyberspace. So definitely this is an interesting setting for us as individuals to live in and organizations to function in. Um, and particularly in the setting of marketing, we did notice that social media can be extremely powerful through the means of, as I said, moving away only from the interaction through the means of transaction to having an opportunity for relationship building, for community building, for building the whole tribes around the brand. We know that there is a lot of power within the communities through support, through criticality, etc. So this is something very new that marketers are exploring since the emergence of social media. And just to give you an idea what kind of short period of time we are talking about, we are talking about the recent 25 years uh, since the internet became much more available to people, to individuals, but also to brands. So we see the development of social media uh, is as short-lived as this. So we are still learning. So obviously, all of this, I said, is, is very powerful, very positive. We can interact uh, with many people across borders like we are today. You know, we don't have to fly to Jakarta to see you. We can be in, uh, well, sunny Lancaster. I had to have a quick peek out the window. But also what we can um, think about is the other side of social media. So... If any of you, whenever you're doing any search online, whenever you're interacting with your smartphone, with your laptop, with your um, tablet, whenever you perform any transaction, you talk to your friends, maybe some of you have smart home devices like Alexa or Google uh, Dot, you're also actually leaving a digital footprint behind. So Google and those big companies like Meta, like Google, they are collecting data about you. And obviously they are allowing us to use their services for free, but is it really for free? So there is always a question, are we Google customers or actually are we Google's product? Because then they tend to sell our data to the advertisers to target us better with their products and services. So this is our, like a good challenge to think about later. And today we want to talk to you about two um, case studies that involve um, social media, but also very particular part of social media. So working with influencers and how, you know, obviously we, we said about power, powerful social media can be, but also it can cause a lot of trouble. So first, um, first case study I want to talk to you about is from my home country. So I'm from Poland. Uh, probably if you follow some news, you heard a little bit about Poland in recent weeks. But, you know, so just to just to bring you a little bit of context. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of our luxury um, products, right, luxury fashion sellers, Moliera 2, decided to partner up with a charity for children's cancer and organize a day where they asked people to share the selfie or a picture 
of their feet wearing high heel shoes. Uh, they picked 25th of September to do this. And basically anybody who would publish a picture with the appropriate hashtag, hashtag Dzień Szpilek, which means high heel day, uh, would then be entered into the count of the brand. And they will pay two zlotys, which is equivalent of about 40 pence, into the charity uh, fighting children's cancer. And obviously, if you think about it, this kind of um, attract this activity attracted a lot of people because a lot of people feel very strongly about curing children's cancer, supporting such a noble cause, etc. Even if they were not customers of Moliera before, they said like, "Oh, I will go on to it." Including some guys, some male uh, citizens, yes, some male uh, males decided to post a picture in high heel shoes saying. This is, I don't mind looking a little bit silly. I'll borrow my wife's high heel shoes. It's for the good cause. So at the end of the day, um, over 600,000 pictures were shared. We are talking about a country of 34 million people. So this is quite significant number. What also helped with this um, charity day was the fact that they engaged with a lot of singers, actors, celebrities in Poland to promote this day. So obviously huge success here, 600,000 pictures shared and people said like, wow, what an amazing help for children because it added to 1.2 million zlotys, which is a significant amount if you do the math, even in two pounds. But then a few days after the activity uh, and the day finished, they noticed that in a financial statement from the brand, actually only 223,000 zlotys were paid into the charity. The question here is why this happened. So obviously this is, you know, this shows us so far the success of the social media campaign, how powerful social media can be, even for the brand that many people may not know because luxury fashion may not reach to everybody, is it? It's very exclusive. Uh, but it attracted a lot of people. Moliera explained that uh, some pictures were not really um, counted because the high heel wasn't high heel enough. Uh, maybe they excluded also male uh, pictures because that's not what they were after. Maybe the feet were not, you know, handsome enough or I don't know, uh, shaved enough or whatever, you know, they started basically making excuses why they didn't pay this money into the accounts. And people get really outraged. Um, and they say, why are you lying? This is not how it should be. A lot of celebrities who participated in the action were also apologizing, saying we didn't realize. Obviously, the damage was mainly to the reputation of Moliera, but also to the celebrities who linked, who partner up with this. So obviously a lot of people had to apologize. Um, and also the learning from this is that actually if Moliera tried to pay this money into the charity account, they unfortunately would go bankrupt. They're too small of a company to handle such a big charitable donation. So you need to be very careful when you're creating those uh, campaigns on social media. Think what will is the best and the worst case scenario and plan for it. The big criticism for the brand was also here that in the terms and conditions, they were not specific enough. Nowhere in terms and conditions, it said that the uh, heel had to be of certain height, uh, that it couldn't be a male foot that maybe the picture had to include knees or didn't include knees or whatever it was, yes? So it is a learning from, for us for the future that if we are uh, thinking about social media campaign, we need to consider all aspects and plan accordingly, particularly with terms and conditions, okay? So this is a bit shorter case study, but let's move into the, the bulk of a case study. So the other case study we want to highlight to you is this one of Fire Festival in 2017. So this festival was organized in the US, mainly for the US audience, um, and included a once in a lifetime experience of a music festival, going to the Bahamas, having luxury uh, music festival, 
including yachts and beautiful crystal water and the best music and the best experience of your life. This is how they were uh, promoting it. To promote the festival as well, they included a lot of names in the fashion. So Kendall Jenner, Hailey Bieber, a lot of supermodels were uh, posting stuff on their social media. There were videos, pictures created like the one on the right here on the slide where people are on the yacht, you know, enjoying their life. However, um, none of them were saying that this was a sponsored content. And this is actually what led to a lot of problem. So, sorry, Costas, I know I will be handing over to you in a second. But just to tell you what happened actually in reality. So we were promised the luxurious music festival. Actually, none of this happened. Look at the picture on the slide. We're seeing muddy field, tents, toy, 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 toilets. None of this screams luxury to us, okay? So think about this kind of instance of Instagram versus reality scenario. This is exactly what happened. None of the luxury was delivered for the festival. Yes. So now I hand, hand over to Costas to tell us what happened. Thank you, Anna. I'm going to be the bearer of bad news. So you can see from the picture, yes, from the porta potty there, that the actual festival was an unmitigated disaster. We're just stating the obvious here. So in terms of its organization, but also in terms of the actual delivery of the festival, there were certain things that we can identify that belong to something we called uh, malpractice, I'll call it that, yes, or immorality. And we're, of course, referring here to there was lying involved, a little bit of irresponsibility, lack of respect towards the customer, unfair and deceptive practices, even because it ended up this particular case, also it was disputed in courts, there was also something called fraud and misinterpretation. Now, there is a lovely documentary on Netflix, if you have access to Netflix, that actually documents the entire unfolding and the entire disaster that was the Fire Festival. Now, from the documentary, I have copied for you an interesting exchange between one of the key participants called Ja Rul. I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing their names. I'm not up to date when it comes to celebrities, but apparently the GR there stands for Ja Rul, who is a music producer, probably an artist himself and a mogul. And uh, just to give you an idea how the whole ethical domain is being negotiated and certain tactics that people use to either shift responsibility or to make immorality, in inverted commas, sound a little bit more normal. So Jarul said, referring to an employee from the same organization that was responsible for, to, for responsible to deliver the festival, and he said, ah, we didn't kill anybody, nobody got hurt, we just made a mistake, we'll get past it. Imagine, yes, the disappointment of the customer, and this is how the organization of course, through the voice of Jarul, was trying to negotiate the disaster. Now, the employee comes back and said, I mean, granted, nobody died, but we did flat out lie to the public about what we were giving them. I mean, that's fraud. So the employee is trying to name the ethical, the ethical aspect of this festival. Like, that's not okay as a company operates. And then Jarul, Jarul responds by saying, that is not fraud. That's not fraud. That is, I would call that false advertising. So this is a little bit of the, an attempt, if you like, to blur the boundaries between something that can be presented as fraud and something that can be presented as false advertising. Now, let's move to the next slide. I'm fully aware of the time, yes. So what would a marketer do if, or marketers do, if they had to, practice their profession based on a particular ethical sort of code or ethical standards. Now, the American Association of Marketers, of course, provides for us a particular sort of code of conduct, what we call professional ethics. And according to them, 
any attempt to market a product or a service or even an experience, which was the case in, uh, for, in, in relation to Fire Festival, their conduct should be informed by six important codes or moral guidelines, if you like. The first one refers to honesty. Marketers should be forthright in dealings with customers and stakeholders. Stakeholders, what do we mean by stakeholders? Everybody who is involved or has at stake at a particular service, product, or experience. The second important code refers to responsibility. We have to be able to accept the consequences of our decisions and strategies and claim the responsibility. We shouldn't shy away from it or hide away from it. The third relates to fairness. A marketer should be able to balance the needs of the buyer with the interests of the seller. We're not suggesting for a second here that this is an easy task to perform or an easy balance to achieve, but at least the behavior of a marketer should be informed by that attempt to balance the different interests for the sake of fairness. And then the fourth relates to respect. Marketers should acknowledge the dignity, the human dignity of all stakeholders, which belongs to, and I'm going to drop it there, it sounds a little bit fancy. It's part of what we call deontological ethics, something, a rule that is binding, that, that relates to respect. And then we move to transparency. We have to be open and frank and honest in terms of how we do things, in terms of our operations, how we manage and how de we deliver and how we present a particular product to the customer. This is fundamentally important. And then finally, which is a little bit more of an inclusive concept, the sixth code of conduct refers to citizenship. So an organization and the marketers who are being part of that organization, they need to fulfill the economic, legal, philanthropic, as well as societal responsibilities that serve all stakeholders. So if you're wondering, what do I have to do to act ethically or morally? We can use these terms for this particular case interchangeably. If I am to market a particular product, the particular association gives you some very helpful guidelines. Now, if we are to take these guidelines and apply it to the fire festival, I'm not entirely sure they have fulfilled any, but anyway, yes, probably not. Now, moving to the next slide. Just before I let you move yes. on, because there's a quick, yes. a quick marketing lesson from this. So yes. on the bottom there on a the slide, you can see that after the fire festival, actually this created so much discussion within the, the industry that all um, countries and particularly influencers and celebrities uh, promise that from now on, they will always disclose if they are sponsored for publishing any content. And this is now a legal requirement, uh, particularly in the EU. If you are working as an influencer, you have to disclose, for example, by the hashtag ad or sponsored or promoted when you're being paid to post certain content. So good lesson there. Excellent. So now... We move on to something that in academia and something that we at Lancaster University do quite a lot is we're always attempting to dig a little bit deeper and be a little bit provocative as well in terms of our thinking and in terms of our inquiries. So on the surface level, if you like, the fire Festival seems to be or seems to have been an unmitigated disaster. However, Anna and I think that yes, it was a disaster in terms of its delivery, but it was a success in terms of what it attempted to capture. And that, that's why people, people like us and people like you, flocked to participate. They wanted to be part of something. So how can we explain this need to be part of something, to be there, to be in the Bahamas and enjoy this kind of a lifestyle? So the important thing, and this is how it was marketed, that... It was a particular, if you like, idea, a particular identity. And we have some lovely quotes just to give you an indication of how powerful marketing can be when it relates to our very own identities. And uh, I'll start with a quote by the entrepreneur and visionary and the guy who was perhaps the most responsible for all this, William. I'll call him William by the first name. 
So how was it actually marketed? And just listen to what he had to say. I think these quotes are quite powerful. So according to William, he said the following, we are taking the dream of the average person in America or wherever they are and say for three days, you can become like somebody called Pablo Escobar. You probably know who Pablo Escobar was. I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> yes, but everybody I suppose knows these days about Narcos, which is a very sort of up to a, 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 a series, I can on Netflix, I think, yes. So they, they were trying to sell a vision about who we are, about the values that we identify with, and perhaps the life that we want to live, even if that life lasts for three days. And then again, our friend Jarul, a mogul, that's how he describes himself, guys. Yes, that's not me trying to describe him. He said, oh, living like movie stars, parting like rock stars. And of course, the question for us is the following. Who would be able to say no to this? No, I don't want to party like a rock star or live life as a movie star. And then finally, the director of the organization who was responsible for this. And this is an important sort of change or shift, if you like. And I'm going to quote him now. Who was playing? what the food was going to be, and all the things that typically sell a music festival was not the sales point. So the actual product, if you like, was not as important or as powerful as, and I'm going to continue with the quote, as selling a dream, selling a concept, selling a vision. And when we're talking about a dream, a concept, and a vision, we're talking about the ideas and the understanding that we have about who we are and who we want to be. That's why the festival was for us, if you analyze it from an academic perspective, quite a success. Now, next slide. So what can we learn from this and using these sort of powerful quotes? Was it marketing wise, was it a success story? Now, what we want to say is the following, that if we indeed are allowed to scratch beneath the surface, and analyze this phenomenon called the fire festival from an academic, or I'm gonna use a little bit of a fancy term here, a scholarly perspective. We see a very powerful set of ideas about things like our dreams and aspirations, things about our values and what we hold to be a, a good and fulfilling life there as the basis that was used to support the marketing strategy of the fire festival. And we would also argue, Anna and I, that contemporary marketing is actually based upon this particular premise. It is not so much about the products and it, the product and its functionality, but more about what kind of an image do we want to create when it comes to the most important stakeholder in this, the customer. So to put it simply, the marketing of the fire festival reveals some in inverted commas, I suppose, truths about what we think of life, of happiness, success, beauty, acceptance or approval. Are you going to be part of the festival? It's a unique opportunity to be part of a select group, our sense of belongingness and friendship. Now, just to provide a little bit more of a succinct point, you have to be able to recognize as a student of this particular sort of phenomenon called marketing, how powerful marketing is in terms of configuring and constructing particular identities. I'll give you another example. And this is always the example that I use in lectures. What is the difference between, in terms of how we see a person who uses a MacBook, let's say a MacBook, or a person who uses an old, I don't know what, a Dell laptop. You see, because we associated Apple with Persons who are creative, who think outside the box, persons who are a little bit more hipsterish. Now, and of course, the question is, who would actually say no to spending a weekend or experiencing a life like Jarul or Bella Hadid? Who would say no to feeling exclusive, extraordinary, unique, glamorous, organic, or authentic? It's very hard to actually say no, because even I'm going to venture and I'm going to say that these particular set of ideas or set of ideals and values operate even at subconscious level. 
we sort of assimilate them, we entrust them, and then we just follow them. Now, next slide. So what can we learn from this? This was a very powerful story. It was a very powerful story in terms of how powerful indeed, excuse the pun, marketing was in relation to the Fire Festival. But also it is a story that illustrates the power of marketing today. We drew here, I suppose, three points that I think are worthy of consideration. First and foremost, that marketing has shifted from the consumption of products. I'm going to buy this because there is a need a hammer to nail, uh, to hammer a nail into the wall from the consumption of identities or lifestyles. And uh, according to some authors, the contemporary economy is based upon precisely certain things that we call transformative or immersive experiences. You buy something in order to become someone. Yes, this is about your personality. Then, secondly, we can argue that, of course, there is an associated utopian vision that relates to social media as a way of marketing. This is what we mean by a medium. And the vision is based upon that marketing or even organizations that would extend that. Uh, is, uh, marketing is, what is quite free or democratic or accessible or equitable. You see... And this is important. Now, I'm aware of the time, but this is an important point. Free and democratic, anybody today, and this is the power of it, can, for example, set up a camera, order a product from, let's say, Amazon, or buy a product from a shop, and record himself or herself or their selves and do an unboxing video. So without these people realizing, they're part of the marketing apparatus. You can post it on YouTube and somehow, without even having to be paid by an organization, you're advertising a product. So marketing has managed to permeate all different avenues and aspects of life. Even when we provide, let's say we buy something and we provide a commentary, review the product, that also becomes a part of the marketing mechanism. Now, of course, because again, this is an academic approach, we have highlighted certain things that are, let's call them a bit positive, if it is a utopia, but we also need to be aware of some of the negative aspects. And this is quite important. What we call a dystopia. If something is a utopia, the perfect place, maybe there is a place where things are not so perfect. And of course, we're referring here to issues such as social conformity and peer pressure. Just imagine yourselves how many times you had to look back at the post from the latest sort of your holiday and the food that, or something that you bought and you were thinking, is it trendy enough? Do I need to do something else? Because you see my latest picture when I was buying, let's say, food from a trendy restaurant did not receive as many likes as my friend's post. So there is an internal competition and you, you are caught up in this sort of a nexus. So are you part of the tribe? And is your life interesting enough to light a fire? Excuse the pun. And we do that all the time. Just think about Instagram, TikTok. Face, Facebook is not as trendy nowadays, I think. Or Meta, sorry. And uh, Twitter. And many others, there are so many different platforms, it's so hard to count them or include them all. And then, of course, this is the first one in terms of social conformity and peer pressure. We have something called ubiquity. Ubiquity is when something takes over and controls quite a range, wide range of life itself. Can you actually escape it? Can we think of a space outside of this when or where we wouldn't have to post the latest product that we bought, or the latest holiday, or the latest food, and so on and so forth. I think life would, would probably be unimaginable without it. They have become so referential, yes, to such an extent that they are the parameters of our communication with friends and peers or society in general. And then, of course, the distinction between the real and the virtual, the private and the public, who are we and who is watching? Anna have highlighted this issue. We think we're in control, 
We think that we can control the image that we present to the world, even the way that we market ourselves to a certain extent. And then, of course, we realize that there are certain other institutions there that are actually controlling as well, yes, or they're controlling that image too. So these are some of the interesting questions that preoccupy us. We do a lot of research about them. And uh, it, it is what makes things quite interesting and challenging. Now, we have, I think, another slide. I'll we jump in the... here a little bit. Because yes, obviously, do. Kostas, you, you've done excellent presentation of dystopia here for, for our, our participants today. But I want to give you one example that can be much closer to you guys. And I want you to, I don't want to know the answers. It will be very private. But think about it. If you're taking a selfie, if you are actually using social media, how many selfies do you take before you post one on your channels? Is it one? Is it two? Believe it or not, some people take as much as seven to 900 pictures of themselves before they post a single one. Remember, all the filters, all the retouching. And people attach a lot of emotion to those selfies. So social media can be powerful as well into affecting how you feel because we did see, uh, we did speak to certain people posting on social media and they say like, if my picture doesn't take at least 10,000 likes, I will delete it. It makes me depressed. See how powerful impact it has on your lives. Um, you know, and if you don't remember, you know, the, the cameras that didn't, have the digital cameras, but you know, rather than film cameras, it would take one picture and sometimes it wouldn't, wouldn't work. Now we have the power to take 700, but is it actually a better solution for us? Okay, Costa, so there's your next slide here. Excellent. So the provocative question that we want to ask you guys, and perhaps this is the question that will allow us to conclude this short presentation, if we have a bit of time, you can ask us questions. I'm also, you know, just allowing for a bit of time. What happens when dreams become reality? Or, which is the most provocative of all questions, who influences our dreams? Are we really in control of our dreams? Or there are certain institutions, agencies, who are actually influencing the very way that we think about ourselves and the, way, the very way that we think about our lives as well. So, Another quote, I think this is the final one, by somebody, I had to learn all these names and who these people were, ah, still are. Somebody called, and the name is absolutely extraordinarily important, Gillionaire, who apparently is a DJ and a music producer. And I think he has managed to encapsulate what we are trying to convey to you guys brilliantly. So the quote reads as follows. We live in this influencer society, you know, Everybody wants to have this online cloud, you know. People want to have access and they want exclusivity. Fire was basically Instagram coming to life. And this is where it's true power to influence our dreams, to influence the way that we present ourselves and we think about ourselves, to influence also the way that we think about the community. Oh, we are like them unique and extraordinary and that is the power that fire had and that is the power that attracted so many people to go there now of course the reality we have described it was completely the opposite now and finally as the last if you like a little bit of a warning i suppose i don't want to alarm you guys is that this is from the fire festival the main leaflet i suppose this was part of the marketing material that said, seek those who light your flames. But we also need to be a little bit apprehensive when it comes to those individuals or organizations who seek to light our flames. Yes, that's, I think we have reached the end and we, we may have the opportunity for a little bit of a Q&A before we move on. Yeah, so thank you very much, guys, for joining us uh, on this part of the presentation. Obviously, you have, have other speakers as well, but uh, we can accept any questions if you have any right now, because both of us have unfortunately teaching to do, so we'll have to disappear before the end of, 
of the entire session. The power of the fire festival. It was very interesting, Anna. And Costas, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, everyone, any questions? If you have any questions. Do you, uh, Anna, one question from my student. He is yeah. currently engaged with the school, so that's why he's not attending. Um, how, how is the scoring system? Um, most students who is doing business program under your under your program um so business management is a program that is collection of modules from all our academic departments in management school mm -hmm. and each module will have slightly different assessment modes so students will be assessed by uh via examinations obviously uh, but also coursework so there will be a variety of coursework essays reports presentations simulations um, those can be either individual or group uh, so basically every uh, module will be assessed slightly differently and students do find out about it in the beginning of the module but also in the program handbook we do provide this information to students even before they take the, the module. So when there are some optional choices for students, they can see the forms of assessment. And usually on every module, we have two points of assessment. Uh, so usually it will be one coursework, one exam, or two pieces of coursework. We very rarely, are, to be honest, I don't think we have a module that would only rely on the examination. I so see. hopefully this helps. I see. Right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, okay, Dia, must Dia, do you have any questions? Go ahead. I see you raise your hand. Okay. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity, and thank you, sir and ma'am, for the marvelous presentation. Uh, I I'd like to ask you something, and according to that presentation, uh, what's your opinion about social media impacted on our on personal branding is it limit us or the society to be the base in social media and do not accepting our bad sites what do you think thank you so maybe i will start and then costas can take this from his perspective as well so obviously as you know i am teaching social media here at lancaster so i am a big um you know fan of social media from one hand. So I, I, I see the uses of social media, how beneficial it can be. But also what we try to convey to you in the presentation, you also have to be aware of the dangers. Um, so, you know, there is many cases where power of social media did help us as a society, sharing information, uh, breaching the borders, you know, learning the cultures, experiencing a lot of amazing things you know obviously we we are still within pandemic you know and how much social media helped us staying connected with our loved ones through the pandemic um, that's definitely great benefit of social media but also you know even with the case studies we have presented we have to be careful with privacy issues with image of ourselves as people that social media can, um, you know, highlight that, you know, we don't feel that good about ourselves. So obviously we have to always have a balanced views of the benefits versus the uh, disadvantages. Cost us anything from your perspective. You have highlighted a very important, so Anna, absolutely, you've covered everything, but just to reiterate basically and highlight rather than add something to your argument. Our approach here is the following. And this is what we call a scholarly or an academic approach. Rather than treating things and we take, we treat them unquestionably or we take them for granted, right? A bit like a black box. The task of a scholarly engagement is to provide a little bit of a balanced view and a balanced analysis. For example, social media can be liberating. They have some positive aspects, absolutely. But we also constantly need to be aware and vigilant about their negative 
dimensions or aspects as well. So this is the sort of, if you like, the approach that will establish a fair and a balanced analysis and investigation, not just to social media, but to any managerial, organizational or social phenomenon. I'll use the singular. Excellent question, by the way. Excellent. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, thank you, sir and ma'am, for the information. Thank you. I can see there is another question okay. in the chat. I don't know if um, we, we are allowed to answer so far. Thank you for your question. You're asking if, um, if we learn how to be an influencer. So in my module, you know, I run a second uh, year module here at, at Lancaster Management School that is called Social Media Marketing. And we do have some classes on influencer marketing and word of mouth, uh, digital word of mouth. So even though we are not, remember, this is the university course uh, that we're talking about. We are not talking about practicalities, run a post like this and you'll become an influencer, but we investigate and we evaluate mechanisms that influencers implement in their activity, like engagement, like loyalty, like encouraging cognitive, affective and behavioral uh, engagement within their audiences to then, you know, get more recognition, get more visibility. So we are exploring, you know, the um, uh, virality of content on social media, which then can be turned into tools to be used by influencers. So uh, just to shorten and succinctly answer your question, no, I will not teach you how to become an influencer, but through the exploration of academic concepts, case studies and research, you will learn what mechanisms are um, you know, guiding the influencers phenomena. And therefore, if you implement them yourself, yes, by all means, you can become an influencer. I have some influencers who are now paid influencers uh, from the teachings that I've done for them. So in a way, yes, you can learn how to become an influencer as well. I mean, if Kendall Jenner received a quarter of a million dollars for a post, that's not a bad career choice, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> for one single post, you know, how long does it take? Like five seconds, I suppose? I, I'm not Chris Jenner, you know, I'm not their mother to, to be so successful yet, but give me some time. <laughs> okay, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, continue to Catherine's presentation, please. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, thank, thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Anna, for your time. Thank you. It was really interesting. Um, I have watched the the, the uh, Netflix documentary, and it is really it's fascinating. But I'm also I'm a bit deflated as I'm looking at my last Instagram post with seven likes. So I think I've got a long way to <laughs> sit on your influencer module. <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. There we go. So yeah, so a, a, a really, really brilliant course. Like I say, I've watched the uh, the Netflix documentary, and it is it is fascinating. Um, also makes me want to go to the Bahamas too. So, um, thank you, Hendra. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I hope you did enjoy the the taster session of a little bit about what Lancaster can can teach you or what you can learn when you're with us. I am going to tell you more about life at Lancaster, you know, what we look like, um, hopefully give you a bit of insight into, into, into what being a student here is. So my name is Kath Fletcher. I have worked at the university for far too many years. This is my, my 30th year at Lancaster. Um, and for the last four years, I've been part of the global recruitment team. So I'm based out at our partner university in, in KL and coming to visit Jakarta frequently. Um, I came back to the UK in March. It was, it was actually two years ago yesterday, thinking I would sit the pandemic out uh, for a couple of weeks and then head back. But unfortunately, I'm still sat working from home. But hopefully things are turning around and I will be out there to see you all in person very, very soon. So Lancaster University, we are, if you look at a map of the UK, the whole of the British Isles, we are right in the centre, right in the heart of, um, of the UK. 
So it's, we're about an hour away from Manchester, Liverpool. So for those of you that have got you know big interest in football and music, we're not a million miles away from them. Uh, about two and a half hours away from London by train. There is a direct line that goes right from London, Euston up to Glasgow, and, and we are right in the middle of that. So about two and a half hours either way. So if you know you wanted to come to the UK and see a little bit, you know, do a bit of exploring, touristing while you're here as well, we are perfectly located for that. We are about an, an hour south, about 40 to five minutes south of the Lake District as well, and we're also coastal. So we are in a really lovely, um, you know, beautiful, beautiful surroundings. Rankings wise, I think Hendra touched on this earlier um, in the introduction. So we are in the top 15 of the UK universities um, and slowly, slowly creeping up the world rankings as well. So I think our, our ambition is to get within that top 100 and we're, we're almost there, 122 in the Times Higher Education. So really one of the one of the, the top universities in the UK. I think this is really important when you are looking at, a, you know, you are researching where you want to study at. It's important. It is important to look at rankings. It's important to look at, you know, big cities. And a lot of people do that. But also look at what the current students are saying about the place. Um, we're kind of really pleased that we're number six in the UK for having for student satisfaction. And it's, so it's really important to, you know, to make sure that you are you, you find the course that fits you, but also you find the right institution that fits you as well. Um, and, and talking to current students, maybe looking on social media about what they are saying about the, the university at that time will give you a really good insight into whether you feel that university is a, is a good fit for you. And one of the one of the really nice things about Lancaster, um, we have an excellent careers service and they will give you a lifetime of support as well. So no matter how many years after you graduate, you can always come back to us. We will support you with anything you need, whether that's networking opportunities, um, you know, CV writing, uh, job applications, tailor making job applications, you know, all the way through your, your time with us at Lancaster while you're studying. We will be giving you opportunities to network with industry leaders. We constantly have alumni that come back as well and give talks about where, you know, where their studies have taken them. So lots of lots of opportunities to connect with employers um, and, and make those networks so that we are trying to make you as employable as possible when you graduate. And that's one of the really important things, as well as getting an excellent um, as well as getting an excellent degree. You've also got the skills, the confidence that you'll need to go into the workplace. I think Lancaster is a it's a the way we teach is a it's research led. So all of our academics are experts in their current field. They bring this into the classroom. So instead of having a, you know, the same curriculum rolled out year after year, they are constantly updating their courses and they're bringing their current research into the classroom. So you can be guaranteed that no matter what course that you, you are studying, it will be cutting edge. It will be up to date. Um, and you'll also get the opportunity to work you know, with the with the teachers, with the lecturers on their current research as well. So really fascinating. As an international student, well, as a, as a first year student, all students are guaranteed accommodation on the campus itself. We have over 7,000 beds on campus. The range of accommodation, go. we don't have any shared rooms anymore because there just isn't an appetite for that. Students you know, don't seem to want that. Well, they don't want that anymore. Um, but we have everything from with, uh, bedrooms with, with basins and you'd share your, your facilities, your bathroom, your kitchen facilities, right through to self-contained studios where everything is all is in one place your cooking um your cooking facilities your your social space it's all within one unit um these i probably as, as a new student i probably wouldn't recommend too much the, the self-contained students the, you know, when you're when you're socializing in your kitchen with other students i think that's probably when you make the most of your friends we have an excellent support and well-being service at Lancaster and it's not just a, a central service as well we have everything from the chaplaincy centre which is a, a, a multi-faith centre which welcomes everybody of, of you know whichever faith or no faith at all um, the academic departments offer support to students so you will be allocated a, an academic tutor who will stay with you throughout your study so any um, academic issues they will be there on hand to help we also have college advisors as well. I'll talk a little bit more about the college system shortly, but 
you will be allocated a, a welfare, um, a, a pastoral advisor as well. So anything that's not related to your academic studies, you know, whether that's, you know, you're, you're a bit of homesickness or, you know, sort of struggling with, with any sort of issues that are not related to your studies, there will be somebody there, um, an, an academic member of staff or a professional services member of staff who will be your sort of pastoral carer as well. We, the Students' Union, also offer a wealth of support. Um, we have a, a large body of students who are elected to come and work in, within the colleges. We have international officers, wellbeing officers. So there's a whole range of support you can get, whether that's a, a peer support from a student right through to sort of our counselling and mental health um, services. We also have a, a medical centre on campus as well. So we would uh, encourage students to register with that as soon as they arrive. Fingers crossed, you won't ever need them. Um, but as part of your student visa, you will have access to the, the NHS service in the UK. So you've got the same, you know, you've got the same access as, as say I would. Um, and that's all within the campus as well. So really convenient. The colleges, I think this is probably where my heart lies with Lancaster. Um, we're only one of five universities in the UK that has the collegiate system. Uh, we have eight undergraduate colleges and one postgraduate college. And they're, they're kind of really hard to sell what they do. But the minute you arrive in Lancaster and you, you come to your college, um, you just have an instant loyalty um, and you just kind of get what it's all about. So no matter, no matter what... Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that was an accident or not. I was muted. I don't know whether I'm to stop talking. <laughs> Am I okay to continue, Andrew? Go ahead, Kat. Go ahead. Okay, Sorry about you. that. No problem. No problem. I just thought you got bored of me and shut me up. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, when you... The colleges, the accommodation is based around your college. So, when you apply for your accommodation, you'll also be asked to choose which college you want to be a part of. So instead of being one of four or five thousand students that arrive each year, every college has its own welcome day, its own welcome week. So it makes the whole experience a lot less intimidating. You know, you immediately start making friends with your with your college cohort. Um, all the social activities go on within the colleges as well. So anything that's non-academic related will happen in your college. They are deliberately not course specific. And this is to give you more diversity of, of friends. So you're not just living with computer science students or you're not just living with um, performing arts students. We deliberately mix everybody up just to give you another support network and to meet more people. And it just makes the whole university experience seem a lot more homely. Um, it, it does feel like part of your family. There is, um, there is a, a, every college is sort of has the same network of staff and students but they've all kind of got their own personalities so again well worth looking at the the, the social media that the students are, are putting out there either on Facebook or Instagram to kind of get a feel for which college would be the best fit for you um they put on a lot of social activities we have there's always something going on whether it's a cooking class or a karaoke night or a quiz so lots of opportunities for social events sporting activities as well if you want to get involved with uh, sport, but not quite at the university level, so a bit more fun, then the colleges have inter intercollegiate competitions. Um, and again, it's just another opportunity for you to meet more people. And we, we you know, really encourage you to get involved with the college. And this is our beautiful campus. So it is like a little city within a city. So all the accommodation is within the campus. The facilities are, are excellent. You, you could remain on campus for the entirety of your studies and never have to leave. Like I said, there's a doctor's surgery there. We have a hairdresser, supermarkets, uh, ice cream parlor, cinema. We even got a nail bar on campus. Um, and although it is in beautiful surrounds and it does look like it's in the middle of nowhere, it's only about a three mile trip into the city itself. So you've kind of got the best of both worlds. You've got the, the sort of safety and the security of campus and the convenience of having everything within a sort of 15, 20 minute walk from the north end to the south end. If you want a little bit more choice, you can head into the city. We've got excellent public transport that goes backwards and forwards every 
five or ten minutes and it's probably about a five minute journey into the city. Um, I think Lancaster is very proud of the fact that it is a, a global university. We have partnerships with over um, 144 institutions in over 24 countries. So although you're coming to the UK to study, you've also got the opportunity to go and visit either one of our partner campuses in China, Malaysia, which is the one I mentioned earlier at Sunway, uh, Ghana and Germany. But we also have links with a lot of other institutions. So you could do a study abroad. You could do an exchange student or you could do the shorter sort of culture exchange overseas experience as well. So really good opportunity to um, to get some you know, networking, traveling experience, a bit more of the world. I think we are a very diverse university. We have students this year from actually over 122 different countries. Um, a lot of our staff are from overseas as well. Um, and we have a global network of alumni across the world. So you will be rubbing shoulders with, with staff and students from, from all over, from you know, across, right across the globe. I think one of the, when I'm sort of talking about the university, the best thing I can suggest is, you know, come and visit. And I know that's not, a, not an option for you at the moment, but once you see the facilities on campus, they are incredible. We're constantly investing in new buildings. There's always something new popping up. We've recently had uh, a new health and innovation centre, which is on campus, which is sort of state of the art and an incredible place for the, the uh, medicine and surgery students to study, biosciences and the sports science. So that's dedicated to them. The sports centre for those with um, you know a bit more athletic ability, that's doubled in size recently and that's reopened. And there is a whole host of, of sporting activities for you to get involved with. And we also have a, a, a brilliant state of the art library as well, which is open 24 hours a day for students to study in. I wouldn't encourage you to study 24 hours a day, but it's there if you want. It's usually rammed at exam time when people are trying to cram their, their revision in. And again, I know Hendra touched on some of our degree programmes earlier, but I, I'll run you through the four faculties. So we have two over 280 undergraduate programmes at Lancaster based in four faculties. So arts and social sciences. I won't read out um, every single subject there, but you get an idea of, of, of what, what our courses are. And, and some of our highest ranked programs are actually in the, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. I know that languages and linguistics in the top three in the, in the UK. The Management School, which was where Anna and Costas are lecturers in. Um, it's, it's one of the leading management schools, business schools in, in the world. We're in the top 1% globally. Um, and we actually have the oldest marketing department in the country. Some excellent STEM subjects, so our science and technology um, faculty, everything from computing, engineering, right through to your, your, your STEM sciences. And then our health and medicine faculty, again, it's just had its brand new um, centre opened up. So these are where our courses run. The sports and exercise science is one of uh, the, the only exercise, sports and exercise that is actually run by our health and medicine um, faculty as well. So it, it really, that's about three or four years old now. And we, we, have, we have something similar to the, the American system at Lancaster. So you have the opportunity, if you're not entirely sure what it is you want to study, when you apply, you will also be, you'll, in your first year, you'll pick up two minor subjects as well. So you can really have a, a, a broad breadth of, of different, different um, subjects. So say you come, for example, to study, say you've, you've been blown away by Anna and Costas' lecture and you want to come and study marketing. You could also pick up um, psychology alongside it, criminology alongside it. You study all three courses up until the end of your first year. Once you get to the end of your first year, you have then got the option to completely change your, your intended major if you wish to do so. So you could come intending to study uh, marketing and end up going with a sociology degree or a linguistics degree. Um, you can also combine two courses as well. So if you wanted to do a joint honors, that's, that's, that you've got that flexibility there and you don't have to make that decision until week two of your second year. So excellent if you're not quite sure, you know, you're not 100 percent what it is you want to study or you want to just have a taster of something else that you might not have had the opportunity to study pre-university. 
So a, a really flexible way of, of truly making the degree your own. Uh, we have some, we do have English language requirements. We do some pre-sessional English courses at Lancaster as well. So depending on your, your IELTS scores or your, your pre-uni qualifications, we have four and 10 week courses just to kind of, you know, bring that academic English sort of, you know, so you're prepared for when you start your lectures. And we also have something called a study start program, which is a two week induction program just for international students. It is the two weeks prior to the start term each year. And it's, it's like an orientation. So just to you know, make you feel a little bit more at home before the swathes of students arrive. We do workshops so to give you an idea of what studying, you know, what studying in a UK university kind of feels like. There are also some trips away as well. So just to give you a little bit more of an orientation, a feel, you know, start to feel at home from the very beginning. Life at Lancaster. Well, the sun's shining there and I'm pleased to say it's shining again today as well. Um, it is a very, very welcoming, very tolerant campus. Um, we have lots of different clubs and societies on campus. And we really do encourage you to get involved with as much extracurricular activity as well. We just don't want you, you know, put your head in a book for three years and study away. So the students union are, um, they have over 200 different clubs and societies. We have a fantastic Indonesian society. Um, they're, they're, I think their membership is about 60, 70 at the moment. I was talking to their president this morning and they have all, there's always something there to celebrate. So although you're coming, um, you know, halfway across the world to study in the UK, you can be re reassured that there is, um, you know, there's that familiar face there. They know what you know, the food you're missing. They know the weather, they know, you know, they, they can sort of support you as well. Um, and not only cultural societies, but we also have academic societies, um, pretty much every sport you can imagine from extreme frisbee to skydiving, equestrian, swimming, um, the weird and wonderful Harry Potter Society, the Disney Society. So there really is something for everyone. And if by any chance there is something that you think of that we don't do, then you are welcome to come and set up your own society and the Students' Union will support you with that. Um, Lang, I, I don't know how good your, your UK history is, but many years ago there was the War of the Roses and Lancaster and York have kept that going. So one of the highlights of our calendar is uh, Roses, which takes place the first week of May each year. They alternate between who hosts it. So Lancaster will host one year, York will host the other. And it's, it's, it's an opportunity for us to... to um, or to, to beat York, really. It's good fun, the students, the Lancaster students, our emblem is a red rose, York's is a white rose, the students dye themselves red for the weekend. Um, we haven't been able to hold it the last two years because of the pandemic, but the previous one in 2019, if you do want to have a look at how much fun it was, if you can take a scan of the QR code on the, on the screen there, um you it'll take you to a youtube video so you can see exactly what's going on and get more of a feel for what you know what the students are doing at lancaster um and how much fun it is so the city itself like i say it's about three miles away from our campus it dates back to the 11th century we have a castle um as you can see on the picture there it was a prison up until about seven or eight years ago, and now it's been turned into a bit of a museum. Um, Lancaster does actually have some teaching space in the castle. So especially for those students that are studying law, we have like a mock courtroom within the castle. So that's really fun to go and do. Um, we, it's got a population of around 100,000 people and there are two local universities. So we've got Lancaster, and we've got the University of Cumbria. So when all the students arrive at the beginning of the year, it tr one in five of the population is, a, is our students. So very vibrant, very diverse. The local community are very welcoming, very, very tolerant of the university because the students bring so much to the community, not just not just the vibrancy, but the economy. Um, and we do have some mainstream shops, but we also have a lot of quirky, um, unique, independent shops as well. We have a fantastic food festival each year and we have we have two new music festivals now. Um, lots and lots of student focused events, lots of um, offers facilities that, that the shops offer for Lancaster. 
the city itself is um, surrounded like a one-way system as well. So it's quite compact. So very easy to get around, very easy to walk around, mostly pedestrianised in the middle. Um, and a, yeah, a, a really be beautiful, beautiful architecture and buildings. And as I mentioned, we are about 45 minutes away from this UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is the Lake District. Um, it is an area of outstanding natural beauty and it is a big tourist attraction for, for, for the UK. And we will, we hold, we take trips regularly up to the lake. So for those of you who are interested in outdoor activities, and I will complain a little bit about the UK weather, but it is, it's, it's not the same sort of humidity that you get in Indonesia. So it's really lovely to go out and climb some hills, swim in some lakes. And this is right on our doorstep as is the coastline as well. So it, it is opportunities to go, you know, go sailing. We've, at the moment, for some reason, the, the, there's a great um, a boom for people wanting to do wild swimming as well. So you've got the, uh, the chance to go and get yourself, dip your toes into some chilly water on the Morecambe Bay coast. This is probably something you're more interested in. Um, so we have launched the Lancaster Global Scholarship this year. So it is based on it is based on academic merit. So we're looking for the students with the you know the high GPAs, the A level results. Um, it is the equivalent of about forty points for IB, A star, AA at your A levels. And this is you don't have to apply for it. It is automatically awarded to any students that meet the requirement. Um, and it would be a five thousand pound discount off your tuition fees for undergraduate and postgraduate courses. Um, Anybody is interested in doing the the MBA with us, then it's an eight and a half thousand pound scholarship for that. I won't read out all the details, but there are some useful links, contacts if you have any questions, or there's you know there's I'm you know happy to get in touch with me. Our international recruitment team are also available well for any questions. Um, whether you want to take a screenshot or I can slide, share the slides with Hendra later, so you've got this information on hand. And that wraps up my presentation. So I'm very very happy to ask uh, to take any questions that you've got about. You know, general life at Lancaster. Yes, and thank you so lot. much for the presentation. Um, you can welcome. share with me later, and I'm more than happy to share. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions?